right, everybody, welcome back to episode two of the professional series here. Just as a quick recap on the first episode, if you haven't watched it, I'll put it in the uh, put a link in the video description. But right now we have done our pre-flight, our uh, cockpit preparation, we've taxied off the gate, or we've pushed off the gate, taxied to the runway, and we are holding short of the runway right now in Dallas-Fort Worth off runway 17 right. And we're going to now talk about um, takeoff procedure and a little bit in the climb out how that goes on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think I got all my, my box set up and everything just like I did from the gate. If there's a couple discrepancies, uh, forgive me for that. I did have to restart the game for this portion of the video. But right now we're top out to 10,000 feet. Our flight plan is from Dallas to Phoenix. You can catch all that programming in the first video. So holding short of the runway right now, we are expecting to hear from tower, uh, either line up and wait, or clear for takeoff and runway 17 right. If they come back and say line up and wait, we're going to acknowledge line up and wait, get the taxi light on, wing lights on, strobes by definition are supposed to come on, however if you're at nighttime, uh, it's courteous of pilots sometimes to just leave those off because there's a lot of planes can be holding around the runway and those stro strobes start flashing can really be an eyesore. Runway turn off light, they will come on. And what we do with the landing lights, it's a three position switch here. So we have on, off, and retract. Now when you put these into off, the lights will actually extend from the fuselage, as you can see right here, here they come. That way when we get clear for takeoff, we just flip them on, boom, and they will light up. So all right, line up and wait for my 1-7 right. Release the parking brake. And we'll line up on the runway. Now another thing to take note, a lot of you guys want to know how do you maintain center line? What's your point of reference in the 320? Well, if you want to maintain perfect center line, Right about here, you see this the break between the PFD and the ND, kind of right in the middle here, this little crease. If you put that on the center line, that should be pretty much centered. You can see I'm a little bit to the right of that. Let's go ahead and move it over even more. So a good point of reference is pretty much right a column here. As we line up on to the center line, now I know there's different techniques. Some guys like to go all the way to the threshold and do a sharp 90 degree turn. And, you know, I agree with that too. It's runway behind you and, you know, is uh, wasted pavement. So uh, if you want to do a real sharp turn back there on the threshold, that's that's okay too. Typically, we'll do that if it's, you know, maybe a little bit shorter of the runway. Um, but I mean, we've got excess of 14,000. 13,000 feet here on this runway, so we should be okay. Um, another thing, so we'll line up and wait, I'll set the parking brake. I was asked about, how do you know your takeoff uh, performance numbers for, for not necessarily your speed, but your accelerate stop distance and your distance remaining, how long is your takeoff roll gonna take? So when we get our performance data sent back from the ACARS, which is in the, the ATSU program here, it actually prints out of this printer, and I'll post an image up on the screen of what a takeoff report will actually look like, and it has all the pertinent information on it. All right, guys, what you have here is a standard uh, takeoff card um, that's been printed out from the ACARS, and what is shown on it, um, pretty self-explanatory on the information. You can see this was a takeoff I did um, off of runway 36 right out of Kilo Delta Foxtrot Whiskey. Um, in all the information pertinent to the takeoff, such as our V speeds, our takeoff weights. So we have a max takeoff weight, the M TOW, 171.9, and we have a gross takeoff weight, 144.1. .1. 
Obviously, we want to make sure the gross takeoff weight is below the max takeoff weight. Also, you can see the max RTW, which is a max runway takeoff weight or a limited takeoff weight. Um, that gets into more complex detail. That's not necessarily for flight simulation. Our flap setting, flaps two, and our flex, if we have a flex. In this particular instance, you can see that this was actually a no flex takeoff. It was a toga takeoff. So flex is dashed out. And the ASDR, one of the most important numbers on this piece of information, is the accelerate stop distance remaining. So when we look at this card, we see 9,119 feet remaining. That means we can accelerate up to V1, 126 knots, reject the takeoff, obviously prior to V1 being called, and stop on the runway and still have an excess of 9,000 feet available. Now, this is a rare situation to see this number that high. This is because this takeoff was uh, designed for toga, and the aircraft was lighter than usual. So... Typically, the accelerate stop distance remaining is a little bit less than that, um, but we are on a really long runway, and a rule of thumb for myself personally is if that accelerate stop distance remaining is 2,000 feet or less, I like to do a toga takeoff anyway, just to make sure that we have maximum room available for landing if we had to do a high-speed reject. So that's just a little bit of information on the takeoff data card. Um, these are the numbers that get uplinked right into the McDo on the performance page, um, depending on how your airline operates or whatever you may have uh, to input it manually, or you can just uplink directly, and it will auto-populate this information into the computer so you can get on your way. All right, so let's talk about the toga takeoff versus flex takeoff real quick here. Um, on the throttle quadrant, we have several detents, and you're probably aware by now that we have zero or idle, climb, flex MCT, MCT stands for max continuous thrust. That is thrust output at a continuous time. So there is no time limit on max continuous thrust. You can, that's your, basically, we use that a lot for single engine operations, which I'll get into later as we start doing abnormals and stuff over on the pilot series. The TOGA takeoff go around mode, that's your maximum thrust at that specific time. So, whether what, whatever your ambient temperature is, your altitude field elevation, all density altitude, all that takes into account, that is your maximum thrust the engines are going to give you. There's also a time limit on the TOGA. So it depends on which aircraft you are operating, what type of engines you have, but there are time limits associated with toga thrust. So you'll see sometimes when people start the takeoff roll, if you're doing a toga takeoff, we'll go ahead and start the chronometer so we know how long the engines will be in toga if something were to go wrong. Um, that's just one of our, our procedures that we do. When we talk about auto thrust, the auto thrust is active from just above the idle detent, so about right here, all the way to climb. That's the auto thrust range. Between climb and flex is more thrust range, but it is not auto thrust. So don't get confused between uh, flex and climb. You can still, there is a band here of, of thrust available, but auto thrust is not available. That's why when we do a flex takeoff, You'll see after we reach our acceleration altitude, which is listed in your perf page, thrust reduction slash acceleration altitude 2110, you hear the engines spool back down when you put the thrust levers in the climb detent because it'll start saying lever climb right here in FMA1, lever climb, which means hey, bring the thrust levers back to climb, let the auto thrust take over. All right, guys, one more tidbit information here about the thrust levers. Now, along with the FADECT and the engine control system, there, the computer, the EEC, or the Electronic Engine Computer, has what's called a keep-out zone on the engines. The keep-out zone ranges from 60% to 74% N1. This range prevents the engines from stabilizing in this thrust zone to protect against engine flutter and therefore will result in a non-linear thrust increase as the thr thrust comes from 50 to your flex or toga. So I see a lot of guys 
when they're doing their takeoff, they're pretending like it's an old school engine and very slowly just increasing the thrust levers into flex or toga. Now that's exactly what you do not want to do. Once the engines are stable at 50%, go straight to your flex or toga position and let the EEC command the thrust change. Therefore, you don't violate the limitation of trying of keeping the thrust out of the 60 to 74% keep out zone. So that's just some hidden knowledge. Uh, a lot of guys try to be fancy um, doing their takeoffs and stuff and working the thrust up nice and slow. It's all electronically controlled now. Let the computer do what it's designed to do and you will live on happily ever after with healthy engines. Side note about that, this is only on the ground. The, the engine keep out zone is only on the ground between 60 and 74%. So in flight, have at it, do what you want to do. There is no uh, caution zone there. So that is just another tidbit about the throttle quadrant. All right, so we've talked a little bit about the throttle quadrant and the different thrust lever positions. Now let's talk about pack operation. I've had a few messages uh, through the forums and YouTube actually. People asking about takeoff with the packs off. There's a video going around in HD pretty sweet cockpit video, looks like the uh, crew is in heavy rain and icing conditions, and they're doing a takeoff with the packs off. Now, the benefit of doing packs off for takeoff is you're going to get maximum engine performance, right? You're not drawing any bleed from the engines to uh, regulate the cabin. So we will do this in certain instances, specifically maybe short runway, heavy gross weight, uh, any type of situation that will degrade our takeoff performance to the point where we want to squeeze every ounce of thrust out of the engines that we can, we'll do a packs off takeoff. If that is the case, it is our procedure to start the APU and run the APU bleed. This way, we don't have to turn the packs off. If the APU bleed is running and toga thrust is selected, the packs will automatically cease and the APU will take priority for temperature control and pressurization. So that is a little bit why you'll see some packs off in some videos. Now some operators will just go ahead and turn the packs off, take off, and then when they accelerate, go ahead and turn the packs back on. Without getting into too much detail, that's pretty much all I can tell you right now. Um, I will do a video in the pilot series about maximum performance takeoffs. But on a day-to-day -day basis, day in and day out, typically you're gonna see this configuration, lights out, packs operating, and that's pretty normal. So if you do want to do packs off takeoff, you can go ahead and just turn the packs off right now. And it's not a, not a big deal. Last thing I wanna talk about before we get going on the takeoff roll here is flex. So we have calculated a flex takeoff today. We've inputted our flex numbers right here at 55 degrees. In so many words, what flex does is it saves the life of the engines by reducing the required thrust output. So we are telling the aircraft to perform as the temperature would be 55 degrees even though it's only 14 degrees outside. Why do we do that? Well, like I said, it preserves the wear and tear on the engine, it helps prolong the engine, um, it's less, less stress on the engine, so pretty common procedure with flex almost all the time. Now, it is also a little less common, but every now and then we'll do a no-flex takeoff. No-flex takeoff would be anytime there's contamination on the runway. So if it's raining outside, there's snow on the runway, ice definitely. So any type of surface condition that will affect takeoff performance, we're just gonna do a no flex takeoff because at that point, we just want maximum performance from the airplane. Also, wind shear. If there's wind shear in the area, reported wind shear cautions or advisories, we'll go ahead and just do a toga takeoff. So it is, I would say, a little bit less common to do toga but definitely not uncommon 
but the majority of every takeoff is going to be a flex takeoff, unless there's some type of um, contamination or something like that. All right, so we are ready to go. Now on the rotation of the Airbus, you want to aim for about three degrees per second as you rotate the stick aft. Now I've seen a lot of guys on YouTube, um, some of them even doing tutorial videos where they rotate the airplane for takeoff and they end up triggering alpha floor. Okay, alpha floor is a predictive function of the Airbus protection system. So it thinks that you are going to end up in a low speed, or maybe not even, I shouldn't even say speed, it's not related to speed, a very high angle of attack situation that could incur a stall. So alpha floor will kick in, and then you're going to get into a situation called thrust lock. Thrust lock means that the engines are going to be locked at toga thrust until you get out of thrust lock by simply moving the thrust levers bringing them to idle, re-engage them, and then re-engage the autothrust. So if you rotate properly at about three degrees per second, you should never get into alpha floor. If you yank the Airbus off the ground, then you're definitely gonna get into alpha floor and you're gonna have issues, and you're probably gonna get a call from the chief pilot if you don't strike the tail. If you do strike the tail, you're probably gonna get fired and all of the above. So, very important, nice smooth rotation, three degrees per second. Let's see if we can go ahead and achieve that here. I'm going to leave the uh, ND up. Well, I'm sorry, the PFD up because I know uh, it's a little hard to see when I have it down. So we'll say 5 Vector 320, you're cleared for takeoff. RNAV to LARN. That's our first fix. RNAV to LARN, clear for takeoff on my 17 right. Brakes released. What we do now, well, brakes released. Definitely want to release the brakes. We'll spool it up to 50%. Just come straight to 50. Let the fade at control the thrust. Once your end ones become stable at 50%, go to your flex detent. Don't move them slowly. Just go straight to the flex detent. Let the fade at control the speed of the acceleration of the engine. Uh, we should have nose forward on the stick. Approaching 80 knots, we verify that our thrust is set. It is. The forward pressure on the stick should become neutral by 100 knots. There it is. Five knots prior to V1, we call V1. Rotate. Three degrees per second. Positive rate. Gear up. And right to the command bars. Or adapt mode. PLI or pitch them an indicator up here, 30 degrees, nose up. I don't know why that is on by default. In a marker, we don't worry about that. All right, we're approaching our acceleration altitude, so this is where it's going to say thrust climb, well, I'm sorry, lever climb, and lower the nose. So what, what I like to do is I always lower the nose first, Get a positive trend in airspeed here, positive trend, and now we can go ahead and move it to climb. Now you can see I can move the thrust lever between the MCT flex and the climb detent, and there is thrust available here. So you can see, look, I can move it a little bit. There we go, well, there's plus. I guess there's not. There's no difference between 55 and, and uh, our flex temperature at the climb right now. So. But sometimes you'll actually hear a significant reduction in thrust when you go from the flex to the climb D10. All right, here is our S speed, flaps zero. Verify zero on the uh, upper E cam there, and we can begin our turn. Now you'll notice that I'm flying kind of through the uh, flight director. 
And that's normal. You're not going to be able to stay on the flight director 100%. Now, you definitely want to be as accurate as you can, but it's going to go ahead and start a turn and it's going to jump out in front of you. Don't go ahead and roll the airplane into, you know, a 40 degree bank trying to stay right on it. Fly the airplane like you're going to fly any other airplane and try to stay on that flight director nice and smooth. Sometimes less is more when you're following the flight director. All right, the aircraft is accelerating out to our climb speed. 240 knots is our first restriction at LARN. You can see that here. I'm going to go ahead and turn on autopilot one just because I don't think I can talk a little bit more without looking like a really bad pilot here. Our restriction is 240 knots, 5,000 feet at LARN. We're above 5,000 feet. That's not going to be a problem. We can always verify that here. We can see altitude constraint is plus five, so we're already above five, no problem. We're just holding the speed. Now, where our procedures are, the pilot not flying, as soon as you retract the landing gear, you would disarm the speed brake and vice versa. As soon as you lower the landing gear, he arms the speed brake. Also, our chronometer would have been started as soon as the gear came up. Beautiful morning to take off out of Dallas. Alright, as we approach 10,000 feet, now to make it more simple, let's go ahead and say, they say, hey, go ahead and climb maintain 15,000. So we've got 15,000 feet set. Now, as we climb through 10,000 feet, it's our procedure here in the United States and where I work. That's where we then turn off all of our lights. I see a lot of guys coming up here and turning off the, uh, the nose light and the uh, turn off light right after they put the gear up. Now, why you can do that, I mean, it's not gonna hurt anything. The landing gear actually have, there's a little micro switch that when the gear is in the well, these lights automatically turn off anyway. So this is just a switch position that's doing absolutely nothing. So it's our company procedure. Once we're above 10,000, all of the lights come off. I, I shouldn't say all the lights. I mean, the landing lights, the nose lights, and the wing light will come off. So in flight, you'll have your strobe, your beacon, and your nav light. Now I know that varies from airline to airline and from country to country. I know in Europe they're super cranky on the wing lights, which I really don't understand why it's not that bright of a light, but it actually increases your visibility tremendously for aircraft avoidance. Anyway, so we're through 10,000 feet now. We're accelerating. You can see our speed restrictions here in the United States are 250 knots below 10,000 feet. We've already exceeded 10,000 feet, so our, our climb speed now is our managed. It's 335 or 80 Mach, and that's predicated on our cost index. If I wanted to slow that down, say we were cost, in, uh, cost indexed at 20, you'll see the speed actually slows down. But we're flying a cost index of 99 today, so we're going max speed, and off we go. As the aircraft begins to climb, a couple of things to note. We want to verify that our cabin, our vertical speed is uh, climbing here. The cabin is climbing. Right now the cabin altitude is at 2,800 feet, climbing at 200 feet per minute. Our delta P and PSI is in the green. Everything is looking normal. Our vibes, our oil. Not too much to it. All right, guys, I know that was a little bit shorter of a video. Um, but that's pretty much all we've got for a average day, takeoff and climb, going up on your departure procedure. Now, if you were flying a departure procedure that had several restrictions, you want to make sure that the aircraft is obeying those restrictions and, you, and you're flying the proper procedure. Um, other than that, the climb phase is relatively low-key, not a lot going on in the cockpit. Like I said, just verifying your cabin pressure. Um, sometimes we'll come down here and, and work through some, some status pages, but we'll talk about that in the cruise portion of the video series.
So I hope I answered some of your questions. Um, I know I've gotten a couple redundant questions about certain techniques. Now I know I have the pilot series and professional series and the pilot series I'm working on, I'm working with the TOLUS uh, 319, but those videos will apply to the A320. So unless it's a very specific aircraft specific item in one of those videos, then obviously wouldn't uh, apply, but um, very, they're the same aircraft essentially. Okay, just a little bit longer fuselage on the 320, same wing. I am running the different engines over here on the 320 because Flight Factor does not have the IAE modeled. But uh, check out that pilot series, single engine taxi and uh, APU, or I'm sorry, cross bleed start so far to been covered. I hope you guys are enjoying the content. I'll catch you all on the next video.